continuing with the NCERT series, we'll start with the chapter two of class eight. Now, this chapter basically focuses on the various resources. So, you have land, soil, water, natural resource, and vegetation that we'll discuss in this topic. Now, as we have tried to understand the various resources, as resources are being something which is usable for human beings and uh, how do we conserve it and protect it is important. Now, the first resource that we'll be talking to today is land. If we work around the land area on the globe, we can say that three-fourth is water and nearly only one-fourth of the total area on the globe is land. Out of this one-fourth land area that is present, 90% of the population lives on only 30% of the land area. Nearly 70% of the land area is not habited. So it's in the form of either very hot deserts or uh, frozen lands or the Antarctica sheet. So 70% of the land area is not habited. Only 30% of the total land area is uh, of the total area of the earth is land and of that again only on 30% you have 90% of the population that resides. So what are the basic areas uh, under the land resources we understand are deserts, forests, water bodies, plains and rivers. Now the land that is available is useful for various purposes. So I can say some of them do agriculture on the land, there are mining activities, industrial activities, forest activities that go on, you build roads, houses, transportation. So all these are the various uses of land that we see in our day to day life. However, there are various factors which determine the land and the quality and the use. So we can either classify those as the physical factors or as the human factors. When we say human factors, there are two primary things that come into play. The first is the population and the second is the technology. So based on the technology available in a region and feasible, I would rather say feasible would be a good word here because feasibility of technology is more important rather than availability. So when you have technology which is feasible for a particular area or a particular region, you have human factors that come into play and then you might have construction of bridges, you can have construction of uh, tunnels. Uh, airports and more uh, human intervention can be take uh, human intervention can take place however the basic soil quality the climate and the water conditions are the prerequisite to determine what kind of activity can flourish in that area now again we can classify land either as a privately owned land so I can say for example there is a house built up so that house is a private property however there are common resources for example uh, a government garden or the roadways or the uh, basic amenities that we use so those are community owned or community is responsible for those and such resources are known as the common property resources we also call them as CPR now CPR has been an important terminology in recent days where there has been more focus on betterment and improvement of the common property resources that exist and the funding for these common property resources comes from the uh, local bodies. Uh, let's say for example the municipal corporation of a city would work for the common property resources of that region. Similarly for a village area the panchayat would, would look after it. Now what are the basic threats? or the basic hazards that a land resource may face. The first is deforestation or degradation of land I would say. Now if you have a forest area or an agricultural area and there is rapid deforestation it would definitely affect the land quality because on the next rainy season what would happen is all the rich soil would wash away. So you would have decrease in the fertility of the soil that would be witnessed. So deforestation, degradation of land, this could be either due to mining activities, industrial activities. In the hilly areas you have landslides. Problems of uh, soil erosion accentuated again by the deforestation activities and desertification are some of the major issues that you need to look into. Now how we can conserve the land? Since deforestation is a major problem, 
what is the solution? The solution would be planting more of trees. Then I say land degradation is a problem. When I say land degradation is a problem, how can I work around it? I can reclaim the land. So land reclamation would again be important. Limited use of pesticides and fertilizers which are chemically made, not organic ones. So the chemically uh, made for pesticides and fertilizers should be regulated and the region where there is overgrazing by animals that should be changed because overgrazing again leads to barren lands and barren fields. So that is again a problem zone. So this was the first resource that is land, the threats to land and the conservation. The next year is uh, again in the landslide uh, in the land you have a case study of landslide that was that is mentioned in the NCRT material and that is uh, the Rekong Pio near Kinno district in Himachal Pradesh and what happened was there was a severe landslide which damaged the National Highway 22 and the Hindustan Tibet Road. So there have been episodes where there have been landslides and mitigation of landslide is important. Now whenever there is a question on mitigation or disaster management, many students come up facing problems or issues explaining as to how to write measures or mitigation for specifically for landslides because when it comes for, uh, for uh, floods or droughts it's easy to explain but when it comes to landslide people do not have much arguments for it. So here are some of the major things. First is increasing the vegetation cover that would help bind the soil. The roots of the plants would bind the soil as a result the uh, flow or the rock fall would decrease. Then you can have retention wall that could, could be built up and it would prevent the uh, sliding of the rocks and the uh, debris downside. Then mapping of hazard that can be done either by GIS that is a geographical information system or by remote sensing techniques. You could have uh, areas which could be jot down for the regions which are more prone to landslide and the preventive measures can be taken in those areas and the development could be occurred in the specific channelization. The next is surface drainage control work. So the drainage that works on the surface is another important aspect that leads to increase in the uh, landslides. So controlling the flow of rivers and the uh, passage of water is another important uh, aspect when we talk about mitigation of landslides. Now the next important resource that we will be covering is soil. Now if we look onto the structure of soil, you have the parent rock, then you have the weathered rock material, the subsoil and the topsoil which is considered as the most fertile region. Now the soil itself is a thin layer that covers the earth and there are various factors that affect the soil. The first is the parent rock which determines its color, texture, property and the content. Then you have the relief. So based on the altitude or the height of the region, the slope of the region, you have the quality and the thickness of the soil. Then the flora, fauna and microorganisms present in the soil. So if there are good amount of microorganisms in the soil, the soil would be more fertile and the, there would be a higher rate of humus formation which is again good for agricultural crops. The time for the soil to develop and the thickness of the soil is another predominant factor. Then the climatic conditions, the temperature, rainfall, the humidity and the rate of weathering affect the quality of the soil and this quality of soil in turn affects the growth of plants and the agriculture in the region. Now how can the various steps we taken to conserve the soil. The first again I would say is cropping more, so afforestation. Now there are besides afforestation there are some specific things that could be done. For example, first is shelter build. Shelter builds are, uh, are the plants that are grown in the areas which are more prone to wind. So what happens during high wind you would have a lot of top soil that would be blown away. So these shelter belt act as uh, checking the water movement and the wind movement and they bind the soil itself. So you have shelter belts, then you have contour flowing that is flowing parallel to the contours. So when we will talk about contours more, we would see these are lines of equal heights and you what you do is you flow parallel to the contours. So there is a kind of uh, farming that occurs. Uh, in a contour fashion. 
then you have intercropping where you are growing more than one crop at a time so for example i am gro growing one crop that is say groundnut which is which would lead to more of nitrate in the soil and then i uh, again uh, grow another crop say barley which might require nitrogen so what would happen is you are growing crops alternately or you are doing intercropping and as a result what would happen is nutrient from this would be beneficial for this and there would be uh, all the nutrients that the soil would be able to replenish terrace farming is common in the mountain areas and the hilly areas so you cut those in the steps and terraces and you plant uh, you do the plantation then rock dams are where you have uh, Uh, there is a huge flow of water and what you do is you put in lots of rocks to slow the flow of water or to decrease the water flow and once the water flow is decreased the soil uh, fertility would increase because the run off from the soil would decrease again count, uh, contour barriers so these could be uh, around the contours so you can put the stones you can put pebbles so these would act as barrier and they would not allow the soil to wash away and finally mulching that means the bare or the land that is left empty fallow land is put up with some straws as a result it won't be easily blown away with water or wind and the fertility would be regained in the coming months the next important resource is water as we said 3/4 of our planet is water but of the Three fourth of the water, or the two third of the water, total water that is present is saline. So I have the whole globe. I say three fourth is water. Of this three fourth, two third is saline water. So you have a very less percentage of fresh water that is present. Of the total fresh water, which is considered only two point seven percent. 70% is blocked in ice and glacier and only 1% of this fresh water is available for our human use so what basically is what we talk when we talk about water cycle or conservation of water it's important to understand that water that is fit for consumption or human use is very less in proportion to the actual amount of water that is available on the earth now what happens during the process of water cycle is you have the same water that recycles and recycles so i can say the water that was flowing in the rivers of amazon might be billions of years ago the same water is flowing in the rivers of ganga at present so there is a kind of recycling of water that takes place on the globe so in net i can say net to net there is neither addition nor subtraction of any extra water that takes place now to understand the process of water cycle i would be doing it very briefly here so what basically happens is there are two main ways by which water or uh, by which clouds are formed first is evaporation from the ocean body so the water gets heated and evaporates the next is transpiration from the plants so transpiration from the plants from the stomata you have loss of water from the leaves and you have transpiration process that takes place so evaporation and transpiration we can also call it evapor transpiration are the main causes for loss of water from the earth surface this water slowly goes up and condenses al along the dust particles and forms clouds so by the process of condensation you have formation of clouds once the clouds are formed there is precipitation precipitation means rainfall or snowfall or any form by which water comes to the earth back to the earth surface and from the precipitation you have either surface runoff or the water is absorbed into the ground surface and from the ground surface surface it is percolated back to the water body so that's a basic process of water cycle which we have talked about in brief here now there are numerous nations where you have acute water shortage you won't believe there is a town in gujarat which is amreli and a village close to it where you have to buy water even for your daily use and that that has been happening from years now the basic problem here is the regions that you have marked in uh, yellow are the regions which have very less water scarcity and the regions which are marked in light blue are the regions of acute water shortage 
Now, <coughs> the water shortage varies with season and the annual rainfall. So I can say during the months of rainy season, there won't be that shortage of water as compared to the summer months where there would be acute shortage of water. Again, the annual precipitation might vary specifically for a country like India, which is highly dependent on monsoon. So if the monsoon is good, you would have good annual precipitation and there would be less water shortage. In contrast to which, if you have a not an adequate amount of monsoon that is coming in, the precipitation would be less. Again, over exploitation or overuse of water or wastage of water could again lead to scarcity and the most important nowadays is contamination of water sources that is just 1% of the water that we have which is fit for human use is being severely contaminated over the time. So what is happening is the major reason, reasons for contamination is discharge of, from the untreated sewage lines that are flowing in, the agricultural chemicals and the industrial effluents or the industrial waste. So these three, the sewage, industrial waste and the agricultural chemicals are the main cause for the contamination of the water sources. Now what should be done to conserve the water? First is again planting more trees that would help bind soil more, that would lead to more uh, ecological setup and more rainfall. The next is rainwater harvesting that could be done in dry areas. So what is done is there are flat top roofs. So once you have the rainy season, you have accumulation of water on the rooftop and this accumulated water goes to the tank which is attached to it and this water which is stored in the big tanks is used for the months which are dry. So that is one of the techniques which is known as rainwater harvesting. Then the canals which are there should be lined properly. There should be no leakages in order to minimize water loss by seepage. The use of sprinkler technology, sprinkler decreases the amount of water that is used and drip irrigation. This has successfully converted the arid areas of Israel into a kind of good agricultural region. And how does the drip irrigation work is rather than providing ample of water to the crops, you continuously provide water by drip by drip. So you have kind of uh, channels or pipelines that work on and you have a continuous drip irrigation to the various crops that are present. And this is how drip irrigation works. And drip irrigation has been very successful in the desert areas. A classic example is Israel, which has converted a lot of its area into agricultural land. The next is natural vegetation and wildlife. Now, as we talked about in the class 6th and 7th NCRT, the interaction of the three areas of atmosphere, lithosphere and hydrosphere leads to a narrow zone of life which is known as biosphere and on this biosphere you have the life supporting system that occurs and this life supporting system is the ecosystem or the region where actually life exists. Now when we talk about uh, life it could be either classified as flora or fauna. So when I talk about flora it is the plant life and when we talk about fauna it's the animal life. Now when we talk about plants what do we get from plants and why are they important? So I can say we get food, we get shelter, timber, oxygen, they protect the soil, they bind the soil and they also act as shelter belts. So that is the importance of plants. Now what do we get from animals? From animals you can get various products like milk, hide, the skin of the animals is useful, then you have wool, meat, so these are some of the products you get from animals. However, there are certain animals which act as scavengers, for example vultures, jackals. So all these scavengers, they remove the dead material from the earth and they kind of act as cleansing and agents and they maintain the cleanliness of the region. Then again, I can divide the region into the regions of heavy rainfall, the regions of dry arid areas or less rainfall. The regions of dry area will have thorny vegetation like cactus as we discussed in the previous chapters in class seven. And then the regions of heavy rainfall, for example, the tropical land, the region surrounding the north and south of equatorial uh, belt would have abundant trees and ample of vegetation. 
Now again, the forests that are present could be either evergreen forest or deciduous forest. Deciduous forests are those forests which shed their leaf in one season. Evergreen, uh, all the leaves are not shed in a single season. So you have the leaves which are green or the plant looks green throughout the year. On the other hand, deciduous, you would have one specific season where all the weather uh, tree would be bare without any leaves. So that is the basic difference between the evergreen forest and the deciduous forest. We have already covered those in detail. Now, there has been a rapid extension of natural resources. Why and how? So the major re reasons why natural resources have are becoming extinct are the deforestation, uh, removal of soil, the top soil which is fertile, so soil erosion, the various constructional activities that are going on, forest fires, natural disasters like tsunamis, earthquakes, landslides and then human factors which primarily include the poaching of animals or the killing of animals uh, in the forest areas or the banned zones. However, to conserve natural uh, wildlife, there have been various efforts that have been taken place. The most common are the establishment of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries and biosphere reserves. Biosphere reserves are kind of uh, eco zones where you have various activities that are flourished in the various zones. So you have the innermost zone which is the most secure zone and as you move out you have areas where humans are allowed, a surrounding area where uh, research and training activity is allowed. So these are the various kinds of uh, measures that have been taken by government. Again, there have been various awareness programs like One Mahotsa, Planting of Trees, uh, projects like Social Forestry, Agroforestry that have come up. There have been uh, trade laws that have come into action. There have been laws on poaching of animals or uh, severe fines if you are uh, found hunting into uh, wildlife. However, one of the most important one is SITS, that is Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. Now, this international convention prohibits trade and does not allow uh, endangered species to be moved from one region to another. It kinds of protects the species which are which have the threat to survival. So there are nearly 5,000 animal species and 28,000 plant species which are till date covered in this agreement. The most common of these includes the bears, dolphin, cactus, corals, orchids and aloes. So these are the common ones that have been included. With this we cover the chapter 2. We will be covering chapter 3 and whole of this class 8 is basically focused on the various resources. Uh, the conservation and the major reasons for their extension or degradation. So, we will be covering the remaining resources in the next coming uh, lessons. Have a good day.